please join me in welcoming Walter Salas. As we say in Brazil, obrigado. <laughs> De nada. Uh, I thought we could start. I was actually wondering how many people have seen the documentary already? A few people? Okay. All right. So I, w I thought. You're invited for this. Yeah. <laughs> screening tonight at 9 o'clock. So go see it. Um, I thought we could start by talking about uh, you and Jia met each other at the 1998 Berlinale because you were both at the beginning of your careers. You were there with Central Station, and he was there with Shao and I was wondering if you could, could give us a bit of background about how your relationship has developed over the years and how you built up the trust to make a film about him. So good evening again. Um, as Michael said, there was a coincidence to start with. Um, I had a film at the Berlin Film Festival, Central Station, and that same year, um, a Chinese filmmaker whose name I was hearing for the first time and mispronouncing for the first time, Jia Zhengke, um had Xiao Wu, uh, also known as Pickpocket. Um, and that film won the forum at the Berlinale, which corresponds to the director's fortnight in Cannes. And when I saw the film, I was completely appalled by it. Um, not only by how it portrayed something that is very difficult to capture in cinema, which is the passage from um, adolescence to adulthood, uh, but also how the characters um, felt something that actually was so close to me. You know, he was a filmmaker who was acting at the end, you know, the other end of the world and yet affecting me like very few filmmakers do. And I started to continue, and I started to see his new films, Platform, um, which follows, in fact, um, 10 years um, in a, a, a young group of uh, theater actors in China from 1989 um, to 1999, and therefore a decade of change. And there I realized that, in fact, the arc of the characters had to do with the change of a, of a much ampler, um, I would say, resonance, which was uh, the change of a country, you know, the identity change of a country. And I was very drawn since the beginning by cinema that allowed that to happen, which is very rare, to follow characters whose identity crisis somehow reflect a much larger, ampler um, situation. You know, and I said, well, this, this is really a unique filmmaker. And um, continue to see his films, then came um, uh, a really a masterpiece uh, called Still Life in 2006, that film won um, Venice. And in that moment, I, started to uh, realize that not only had he all the qualities that I mentioned, but also um, he, he was really capturing um, something that is also very rare to do, which is um, the times as they are changing. He was um, captured, capturing time itself in his own country. Um, You know, I think that the, the great films or the great movements in cinema that attracted me are the ones that capture um, countries or cultures when they were suffering a moment of upheaval. Mm -hmm. So that is what, for instance, characterized uh, Italian neorealism. Here were, um, you know, a series of great, great filmmakers, um, you know, showing you the reflection of a, a country who was trying to recreate a new identity after fascism, after the Second World War. I fell in love with the Nouvelle Vague because it was somehow announcing May 1968 and all the changes that occurred with that. I, w I fell in love with New York um, independence from the 70s because, 
you know, they were showing me a society that was torn apart by Vietnam. Um, and Jia Junker also did that. He transported me into uh, a specific culture undergoing a, a, a profound change, a profound moment of change. And he was doing that better than anyone else. And this is when um, I invited him to do the documentary. We had uh, one encounter in, uh, in Sao Paulo. I interviewed him at the Sao Paulo Film Festival and I still remember the uh, first question that I asked him, what were the filmmakers that brought you to cinema? And he said, Antonioni allowed me to understand the importance of space in cinema, um, Bresson, the importance of time in cinema, and Hu Xiaoxian, who you're gonna have here this year, the importance of bringing your personal um, stories I into your films. And this somehow guided the documentary that we did. But I bifurcated a lot to answer your, your question, but that's, that's basically how it happened. So how do you, let's talk about your process a bit, how you direct a director who you admire and how do you stay objective or do you even try to stay objective? Do you keep a distance or what was the relationship like when you were actually shooting the material? I think I was always drawn by films on filmmakers done by filmmakers. Um, yesterday I was mentioning Tokyo Ga by Wim Wenders, that the great Ed Lahman was with us tonight shot. <laughs> um, there's a beautiful film on Hu Xiaoxian directed by Olivier Sayas that I also love. And um, what those what those films did, a uh, film on Kerostami by Jean-Pierre Limousin, is that they somehow instigated the desire to do more cinema, and they brought cinema back to the center of the debate. I don't know if that exists in English, the debate. Yeah, the, 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 discussion. the, the focal center of the discussion. Yeah. You see, because what, what's, what cinema was at the very beginning when I started to see films was what it brought was the possible, it opened the doors to new worlds, worlds that you were completely unaware of. You know, you would go into um, the cinema and then you would understand that the reality was much more ampler, much more multifaceted than what you thought it was. And I can't tell you how much more interesting that it was than the reality of my, the house I lived in or the school I, I used to attend. And um, here was cinema, multiplying the possibilities of life itself, mm. you know? Um, I think that films about filmmakers bring you the possibility because they, they somehow um, instigate the desire to know about those worlds that you don't know yet, mm. yeah? Um, how do you direct, now answering the question, how do you um, d d direct somebody? by by? I think trying never to be in positive, I don't know if the word, the word exists in English, um, to impose anything, but to feel invited into um, a, specific, a specific situation. I think that that is um, valid in fiction as well, especially if you try to incorporate what, what you haven't planned during, during your shoot. That is only possible in independent filmmaking. But um, I th 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 give you um, one example. We were we had the, a s the, uh, an architecture for this documentary, a spine, and the spine was the question of memory, the personal memories that that somehow instigate the films that I love, um, but also the collective memory that Jia Junke is registering as he's filming, because as he's filming a country where the word that I found most was demolition. It's really everywhere in China. It, 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 that, uh, to the point where uh, he couldn't recognize streets that he had filmed 10 years before. He was trying to find them for the film and he had a hard time doing that. You know, that, that the idea of collective memory was very much in the center of the documentary. And then a, a third layer uh, which of, of um, this quest for memory, which is the filmic memory, 
uh, that is, we invited him to visit specific um, sets of films, you know, of his films, um, to see how they had aged, you know. And many times it, it, they wouldn't be there, as I as I said. Especially and still life. Yes. In the three ri rivers. Ab absolutely, uh, absolutely, and and the way he reacted to that was was um, quite something to film because he wasn't trying to actually hide you know his perceptions or his feelings about what he's what, what he was encountering but uh, on the opposite he was reacting it in a very um, direct manner um, the fact that we were in northern China almost near the frontier um, uh, with ver very near Mongolia, Ulaanbaatar, also helps because there is a certain, there is a certain um, innocence towards the camera. I would say, you know, you the camera is not a, a point of attention as you are in the streets, uh, if that is at all possible in 2015. Like people uh, aren't as guarded in front of the camera there. Number one and number two doesn't attract the attention as much as it does in other places, you know. Um, therefore, um, I, I I think that to direct Jia was to ask him to actually lead us into these places and to blend in. To blend in, as in fiction, I try to blend in as well, you know. So if I can bifurcate for a second in. You know, when we were doing the Motorcycle Diaries, um, for those who have seen the film, if you remember the part that is in Cusco and Machu Picchu, it responds to approximately 10 minutes of the film, but it, 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 there, was, it, there were maybe a few lines in the screenplay. But as we got there, we were a very small crew because we were, it was only about getting those two travelers through that place, you know? Um, we met, for instance, a little kid who was eager to show us Cusco um, and, and four Indian women who spoke Quechua um, and no Spanish and with one person who spoke both languages. And, um, y you know, we, the kid said, can I show you the city? And, I said, and we said, yes, but could we film? And he said, of course, he invited us in, and the woman also invited us in. So when that situation somehow occurs, um, then something something uh, um, truthful comes up. Um, it reminds me that you should never s land somewhere and start to shoot immediately. Um, Cartier Bresson, the, the great French humanist photographer, whenever he shot in places he hadn't been before, for instance in India, he wouldn't take the camera to start with. He would go in that place, forget about, and he had a small Leica, he would forget about it. He would stay there for two or three days, he would befriend people, and he would feel invited, and then he would start to shoot. So how did you research and for how long? Because I imagine you hadn't <laughs> been to this region before. You don't no. speak the language. No. In fact, we had we we the research. I can say, it, can you say it took eight years? Because <laughs> this is, you know, or even more, because this this has to do with falling in love with the films and uh, Jia being the best uh, in, uh, 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 ambassador for that specific culture, where they speak a dialect called the Shanxi dialect. Um, and, and we were we 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 were introduced to this throughout the years, uh, thanks to him. Then, of course, I read uh, every single interview I could lay my hands on on Jia Zhengke. And then, at one point, once you've done all of that, you have to forget it and so start from new. Mm -hmm. um, again, to mention. Um, you know, somebody I highly admire, Picasso, the painter. He would say that he would uh, tr try to understand everything that he that, that to imagine uh, everything that he needed before starting a painting, and then he would forget it and try to paint with the innocence of a five years old. 
And whenever you can do that with a camera, I also find that there's, a, there's a, an incredible beauty to that. The more prepared that you are, the more you can somehow put aside uh, you know, what you have, which is like a parachute, really, and try to, especially in filmmaking, to act a little bit on, uh, um, I you know, with the intuition of, and, and try to find some th something that truly draws you in the moment, you know, to be in the moment. Um, yes, yesterday I was saying that, in fact, um, to do cinema is about forgetting that you're doing cinema. You know, yeah, in a way, it's about that moment, that collective moment where everybody who is taking part of that shoot forgets that they're doing a fiction or a documentary and they're just registering life as it blossoms in that specific moment. And when that occurs, some kind of a filmic miracle that, that sets up. And um, those are moments that I truly cherish. And they... They don't happen every day, <laughs> so you 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 really you really have to uh, uh, s s s somehow respect them as they as they arrive and and, and allow them to actually to k keep you going as you you go through through the shoot. Judge Anke was very generous, very collaborative, very giving. In fact, there are moments in the film where he um, invites us into his life and that those moments weren't preceded by questions that I had made or Jean-Michel Frodon, um, a great French critic who was accompanying part of our journey was asking. It's just a matter of creating trust, you know, as in many things in life. In documentaries, I also think that it's about that. If you're not doing an investigation, of course, if you're not trying to interfere, I think that we, we, we knew um, where we wanted to go and we somehow tried to create the best possible um, moments for that to happen, you know. It's interesting, it must be interesting for you also as a Brazilian filmmaker. Brazil is a fairly young society going to a place like China that has so many thousands of years of history, but they both, both countries are kind of going through an identity crisis in different but very similar ways. I was wondering if you could talk no, about I that experience. I, I agree. Uh, um, somehow, I s still find that no country has, um, in the last 20 years, suffered such a radical change as China, because it truly went from one form of orthodoxy to another, which is the orthodoxy of the market and glo consumption, globalization. So it went from one extreme to the other very, very rapidly. And Jia Zhengke was the filmmaker who managed to grab that and to um, offer a reflection of his, of our times, of his time. And perhaps also thanks to globalization, what happens in one part of the world has a direct understanding in another part of the world. Um, to the point that in Brazil, as we go through many of the problems that he also finds there, including the eruption of violence that you have in um, A Touch of Sin, those, those uh, problems that he's focusing on seem very, uh, uh, um, how do you say, very close to us. Mm -hmm. You know, they are at the same time very singular. They have to do with that specific society, but there is they echo immediately in in our own society. Mm -hmm. And yes, we're facing the same problems: um, growth. Um, uh, inequity of wealth, I don't know if the, 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 the word inequity is correct, something that Joseph Stiglitz talks so well in The Great Divide, for instance. And, you know, you're facing very similar problems in, in both countries, yet in China I have the impression that everything is heightened to a point that, that uh, in, in Brazil you, you, that you can hardly compare to what happens in Brazil. Going back to something else that you mentioned that like if you do so much planning, you still have to be open to the moment. Um, you're more known for your fiction and narrative films, but I don't think people realize necessarily how much documentary work you do. Um, like for On the Road, I heard that you did quite a bit of documentary research beforehand to prepare. Uh, so I was wondering if you could talk a bit about how you incorporate 
improvising and documentary research. I mean, this is a traditional documentary in one sense, but documentary seems to inform your approach to fiction as well. You know, I think in between fiction films, it's really interesting to get back to documentary. Uh, many filmmakers do that. I think that you know, Vendors, whom I mentioned, is well, one of them who does that constantly. Olivier Sayas does that constantly. And of course, Judge Jonker does that. Um, b before doing Still Life, he was refusing the idea of film that specific reality, which is the moment where um, cities that were a thousand year old were being um, were being uh, how do you say demolished, or demolished yeah. yes, to give way to the largest dam in the world, which is the the Three Gorges, um, and. And he was truly non non willing to do a film about that because TV was over covering it and it was in all media and so forth. Yet when he did a documentary in that specific place called Dong about a painter registering those workers working in the demolition, he realized that it was an incredible subject that he had to grab. Um, and he actually wrote a screenplay in seven days for still life for still life and he dictated it to his to two assistants he he during uh, b because he had th th they they had um imagined that it would be there for two weeks during a documentary and there then came the idea and during the nights he would dictate what still life finally be became and the film is done with such a sense of urgency that he shot, started to edit, and then he realized that the cities were continuing to change. So he came back seven times to actually um, register uh, th that that process as it was undergoing that radical, radical situation. You know that is the most extraordinary example of. Uh, documentary infusing fiction that I can think of. You know, what I normally do is, a, a, when, I, when I prepare for a film, is do either some um, a, a much more traditional, I would say, uh, research, doing photographs and sometimes a small documentary on the subject, um, but nothing like that. That, that is, that, you know, th but really the most unique example that I, I can think of. I normally actually prefer to divert into a completely different subject matter before doing fiction because I think that is what truly helps. It's a little bit like reading poetry when you have a writer's block in, in fictional work. You know, you have to dive away from it. Um, the, 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 very the free association of poetry allows you sometimes to find a way in, in, into n narrative again. You know, it's easier to completely bifurcate it. I find it at least easier to completely bifurcate it before coming back. It's also interesting to compare you and Zhe as directors because he's very much rooted in China and the title of your film, A Guy from Fenyang, definitely shows that. But you definitely go around, you roam, you shoot in Brazil, you shoot in other countries, and it's been a while since you've shot a film in Brazil. I was wondering, if you see yourself going back to Brazil, it's definitely going through some transformations at the moment. You no, know, definitely. I live in Brazil and I'm um, actually finishing two screenplays. Um, why two screenplays? Because I got to a writer's block in one of them. <laughs> and then I opted to start the second one so that, you know, I could actually work in one, in one, w uh, and, and, and again, I think that there's, there's a healthy influence in that change. Um, I, I, I forget to say one, uh, I'd, I'd like to say one thing about what you, what you mentioned, is that whenever you do a documentary, um, you gain distance from where you're from, because you're, you're traveling somewhere else, right? Um, I, I think I'm intrinsically Brazilian. This is where uh, I was born, this is where, where my country, uh, this is where my uh, roots, cultural roots are from. Yet, um, 
whenever you start to gain distance from where you're from, you sometimes understand better uh, not only that place where you originated from, but you understand better who you are. You see? So there's, there's something interesting and, and paradoxical, you know, maybe ab about that. Um, I'd like also to say that sometimes the correlations between um, what, what you do in one moment and what you will end up doing much later are not on the surface. And then they get to the surface, you know? So uh, one example, which relates to your previous question, not, not to the very last one. Um, I did a documentary way before doing Central Station, as I was shooting a film called Foreign Land, mm -hmm. on the correspondence between a woman who was in prison and um, a sculptor named Franz Grasberg. And what this sculptor, who was born in Poland and um, went into exile in Brazil during the Second World War and opted to be Brazilian. What he did was um, to go to the Amazon to take up burned wood and to sculpt that wood into, to give it a second life. And a woman in prison read about him, wrote to him and said, you know, maybe, maybe I can, maybe that is an inspiration for me because I'm, I may, you know, go out soon, uh, you know, to the open world and, um, I need somehow to re 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 recreate my entire life. And the sculpture showed this letter to me. And I did a documentary on, on, on it, which was, by the way, here at New Films, New Directors, uh, many years ago. Four years later, um, I wake up with the idea of Central Station, write 18 pages, you know, with the, the architecture of the film. And then after I did that, I realized that uh, the film is about a woman who never sends letters. You know, to, to, to she people who dictate letters to to her, yet um, she opts not to send it. She she keeps the money, and and at one point she will have to face the reality of doing that, the ethical and uh, reality of doing that. And then I realize that that film only existed because of the documentary I had done five years before, you see, which was about the importance of letters that are sent, you know, and the, f the film that popped up was about letters that never reached their destination, you see. So s s somehow um, there is, a, 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 I would say, a palette of memories that that are over there, and uh, um and somehow, at one point, one gets to the surface and inspires you to do something of a fictional nature, yet it was born years before. And I, it took me a while to realize that, that connection. You know. um, there were two s photos that you sent me right before our talk that we would like to show. If we could show the first one. I don't know. It has to do with Judge Anker as well later, but uh, uh, may I explain what it is? Yeah, let's just show the first one yeah. for now. I had this idea this afternoon, actually, as we were saying we were going to do this talk about Gianna. It's, uh, it seems like a, a, you know, a, a, a very far-fetched um, situation. But this, okay, this was taken um, 10 years ago, and this was when the minute before the Pope Ratzinger was going to be now when Ratzinger was going to be announced as new po as the new pope right and we are in the Vatican and if you take a look at this image there's one there's uh, um, everybody is actually paying attention collectively to what is going on you know, there's a sense of of um, of family almost you know as a film family everybody's looking at the same place and uh, actually waiting for the same thing. Yet there's one person here and maybe one there in the middle tr registering it through a screen. Okay, now we can get to the second, the next one, which is eight years later. It's the taken from the exact same place. 
Okay, so this image has been taken eight years afterwards, and this is where Pope uh, Francisco, Francisco is. Pope Francis. Yes, yeah. Pope Francis. Um, you know, it was the minute before the black smoke com came up. So why did I ask you to show this? Because, uh, of course, the, the process of um, uh, cinema cannot not be altered by the fact that there is a multiplication of images and uh, a, 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 a almost a banalization of images. I wonder if people were really there and if they were going to remember it, mm -hmm. if it, if it wasn't for what they've registered, because they're not seeing the moment itself, they're seeing it through a screen. Um, and if there's a reason why I did the Judge Uncur documentary, it's because I have the impression that in his films you can see things that you haven't you, you have never seen before. You know, you, you're you're um, facing um, something that still brings you news of the world, like like cinema used to do in the 60s or the 70s. You, somehow, cinema is at the cent of again of the discussion in in his films and it doesn't matter if things are registered a thousand times what matters is the point of view the unique point of view that that he has you know the singular perception of the filmmaker um, y yesterday was uh, I came from Barcelona the, f the documentary was in San Sebastian so uh, came through Barcelona and I was, as I introduced the film, I, I said, you know, I, uh, during the whole flight, there's one image that came back constantly to me as I was coming to New York. As on the way to the airport, there was a, a big wheel, which you guys call the fer Ferris wheel, mm -hmm. right? And I've always heard that, you know, the Ferris wheel and it would disappear one day because it needs so much space. They're very, you know, the cities are getting more and more crowded and there's so many other things to do. Yet that Ferris wheel on the way to the airport was full of life of people. And, you know, there were people lining up to get on the Ferris wheel. I said, wha why is that? It's, I said, well, it's because if you on the top of that wheel, you get a unique singular vision of the world. You know, and maybe the films that are going to survive, the cinema that is going to survive, is will be done by filmmakers who offer a very specific, singular vision of the world. And I think that this is what Jia Zhengke does, um, really, in a unique, unique manner. Um, so s singularity, the the perception that you're registering a, wor a, wor a, a world that is still somehow unknown, still to be unveiled you know, is is what I, I think can it still allow cinema to exist. Um, there's an Argentinian um, poet uh, that I love, Jorge Luis Borges, and Borges used to say that he did literature, that what interested in him in literature is to name what hadn't been named yet, you know. And I think that Jia Junker, as Hu Xiaoxian, and other filmmakers are still naming things. And that's the cinema that is worthwhile. We have time for a few questions from the audience. Um, I'll call on you, but please wait for the microphone so that everybody can hear it. So we can start here. Hi, good evening. First, I want to congratulate you, to felicitar because you are an amazing director and you were probably the guy responsible for resurrecting Brazilian cinema back in the 90s. I've been a fan of your work since when I saw Foreign Land, Terra Estrangeira, that made me fall in love into cinema much more and I became aware of your work and I was 15 years old, that was in 95, right? You made that movie? And now that you were talking here, I was kind of realizing the uh, similar aspects that I see in some of your movies, Foreign Land. Uh, I didn't see this new one yet, but I think it, it fits in what I'm talking about. 
It's the, the traveler, the outsider guy outside. Since foreign land, I've seen this. Foreign land, it's out, uh, overseas, and then Central Station, the lady she needs to travel to go to, to find new horizons in other of your movies. So is this something that it's on my mind or is an aspect that you have as an artist? And thanks for your work. You are thank fantastic. Thank you. Obrigado. Uh, I, th I think that that's, that's truly integral to cinema. I think that the, um, the, the idea of actually going to the world and registering, uh, trying to register some, something that um, sensit uh, sensibilizes, I don't know how to say that in English, that, that Sensi sensitizes? Sensitizes you, you know? It that, makes that's you so sensitive. Yes, to, yeah. Yeah, um, is, is really, I think, what brought the first um, documentary filmmakers into places you've you could never imagine, um, you know, before. Um, cinema I is about characters moving through space and time to pick up again what Jajanke had said over there. And movement is an integral part of that. I, I, f I, f I, I naturally go into di this direction because I s somehow associate cinema with it. Um, the films that brought me to, to the films that brought me to cinema uh, are, um, um, I would mention a few films, um, Alice in the Cities by Wim Wenders or The Passenger by Antonioni. They were always about the identity crisis of characters facing um, situations that they they were never, um, I would say, familiar with. They were existential crises created by the fact that they weren't in their cocoons. They were actually, um, uh, you know, confronted with with s something that they had a, a hard time to deal with, and movement was a part of that. So. In in many ways, I think that my um, my films drift from that, and I if it drifts from that, it's also because in my childhood I had that. You know, I I uh, my father was a diplomat during part of his life, and I jumped from um, latitude from latitude country for, and I I I have to say that I hated that. I missed Brazil. I missed the cultural life of Brazil, the culture of the street in Brazil. I missed. Uh, uh, the Maracanã, the, the 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 melting pot, you know, um, and this is where the s cinema comes in. The only place that I could find s shelter in many ways was the s was the cinema house, was the was the screen, you know. And there was used to be ten or eleven. And I, I used to live in in France, in Paris. I hated the cold, hated the drizzle, hated croissants, but loved <laughs> the small cinema that was very nearby. And it, it, it played uh, neorealism, it played, um, um, it, you know, the Nouvelle Vague, it played westerns, Ford and Hawks, I saw them both. Um, interestingly, there was, you know, part of the French critics that were so much for one and for the other, and I loved them both, you know, <laughs> I said, how can you be for and against one, one of these guys. Um, and again, whenever there was movement, I was more uh, affected by it. I mean, you, you th in America, you know it better than uh, anybody else because the, the film genre by excellence of, of America is, um, is the Western. It's about a country being redefined as the characters um, you know, search for uh, that unknown territory, uh, y y you know, in, in, in the West. And maybe, maybe a crisis uh, erupts one, once you can't go further than that. Um, uh, and a friend of mine says, that this, is, uh, this is when you only have two options. Either you go up, and this, that's the NASA program or you go beyond your frontiers and 
this is when problems start to start to erupt. But uh, anyway, th th you know, the films that had to do with that were the films that influenced the cinema that I that I do. Um, so yes, journeying, uh, any form of exile, whether it's existential exile or economic exile in foreign land, <coughs> those those were the elements that draw on the cinema that I do. We have time for one more question. Yeah. Oui. Hi. First of all, um, you're responsible for introducing me to Jajonka's work 10 years ago, so for that I'm very grateful. Um, both of you, um, as well as Wim Benders and Olivier Sayas, as you pointed out, are to me part of a rare breed of filmmakers who work well in documentary and fiction. And not only that, you incorporate, as you pointed out, um, documentary truth into fiction films. Um, so I see a parallel in between, not, maybe not directly your works, but the way you approach cinema. Um, I imagine one doesn't come out and scratched or unscarred from making a film. So my question too is, as a filmmaker doing a film about a filmmaker you admire, how did that, did that affect you in terms of your work? How do you, does that bring a reflection upon your work and life? Betty would share with us, or? Oh, it can, it can, thank you to start with, and, and yes, it can only affect you, and in many ways, I, I hope that, um, I would say the, um, the r is it the riddles of that when you throw a stone in a, in a lake, what do you call that? The Riddle? ripples, the uh, ripple effect. The ripple, the ripple yeah. effect of that. I just hope that it won't be too conscious. In many ways, I hope that it will somehow. Um, y y y you know, instigate things that I will be um, partially unaware of. As, um, again, I think that the, the, it w when, you, when you think about a film, there's a part of the architecture, that the spine, that has to be very visible to you, but there's something that you have to leave to discover as you're shooting. You know, there's this beautiful sentence by Kiarostami that cinema is about the invisible that complements the visible. <laughs> and that that part, the invisible part, is what you have to keep as an asset for yourself. And maybe in doing the Jean Jean Coeur film, this is what I, I hope, I was hoping to get. It's something that I will not be able to phrase to you now, but will be inside of me somehow. Um, that would be the most beautiful gift, actually. And and it would be actually linked also to a cultural, um, how would I say, root of uh, Chinese art of sorts. Because if you look at Chinese painting of the 18th century, there's always a part of the canvas that is in the smog, uh, taken by smog, so that you as a spectator can imagine what's behind that smog and interpret what I is there. Um, so it's, it always trusts you as a, an active um, viewer, you know, which is also what Judge Anke does, because even the painter is not allowing himself to enter into every single, um, I, w I would say, visible aspect of it. So yes, I'm trusting the ripples. <laughs> well, I'm afraid that's all we have time for, but this film is screening again in an hour at nine o'clock and Walter will be there. So thank you very much for the talk. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you.